Hampshire, or part of the uh, university system of New Hampshire. And this is part of my uh, career development class. It's been offered several times. This is my first iteration. And um, this is designed for juniors and seniors who obviously are anticipating graduating. We spend time in the course uh, providing options, looking at uh, things they might do, certainly getting jobs when they graduate, uh, possibly going on to graduate school. But one of the things that uh, I think is most interesting for us and for them is that we have guest speakers, either graduates from the film program who talk about their experiences after graduating uh, and moving into the program, or uh, other professionals within the industry. This is our uh, second week that we have this and we're uh, I'm pleased to welcome an old friend of mine and a very successful filmmaker Lee Unkrich uh, calling on uh, zooming all the way from California uh, Lee thanks for making it with us great to be here thank you Tom yeah um, first of all if you can and you get this a lot uh, give us a little bit of your background uh, I know you're from Ohio perhaps what started your interest in film sure and but moved yet to Southern Cal and your procedure from there. Sure, I'll try to give you the super fast version. So I did grow up in Ohio, um, just outside of Cleveland, out in the suburbs. And uh, I went to film school at USC, uh, which is where I met you, Tom. And uh, I did my undergrad and grad school there. And um, my first work in the film industry was as an editor. Um, I came into the industry uh, right as kind of digital nonlinear editing tools were, were, were just starting to come out. So I was kind of on the bleeding edge of all that. And it allowed me to leapfrog, um, uh, jump forward in my career quite a bit, very quickly, um, editing television, um, and then uh, ultimately heading up to Pixar, uh, where I was one of two editors on the first Toy Story film. And uh, I was at Pixar for 25 years, and I just left um, about a year and a half ago or so. Um, so while I was at Pixar, I was an editor on a few films. Then I started co-directing. Uh, I co-directed Toy Story 2 and Finding Nemo and Monsters Incorporated. And then I directed Toy Story 3 and Coco. Um, and then stuck around, uh, you know, another year or so after that, I was one of the executive producers on Toy Story 4. And uh, when we got that wrapped up, that's when I moved on from Pixar. So that, that's 25 or more years in about a minute. <laughs> yeah, you say you were on the cutting edge, I remember. I'll, and uh, I'll digress one time to tell the story where uh, at, at USC, I believe you worked on like the second avid uh, nonlinear editing system created. Uh, we were doing post on your project and you dragged me into this room and showed right. me, oh, ooh, wow, you could make a cut on a computer. And I was thoroughly unimpressed. I said, that's <laughs> greatly, and left. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so you, you were completely on the cutting edge. Yeah, I was in the, kind of in the, several times in my career, I've been in the right place at the right time. And we can dig into that more uh, later as I give advice about things. But um, yeah, I was just lucky to be in the right place at the right time. And then um, thankfully had the skills to kind of uh, let me kind of take off and, and do really well once I had those opportunities. Sure. And I mean, wouldn't you say that, it, that and I'm sure we're going to have a lot of questions about how did you find your work? How, what advice do you have with that? My feeling has always been that you can be as talented, as successful as uh, the next person, but it does take some modicum of luck. And it does. Close. Yeah, it absolutely does. I mean, I, you know, I get asked for advice a lot um, from young people just uh, starting, getting their starts in the film industry. And what I consistently tell people, because it was what worked for me, is yes, there is a degree of luck involved being in the right place at the right time to get the opportunities. And sometimes you have to be patient for those. But once you do get an opportunity, it's really important for you to make yourself like the most valuable person on staff, wherever you are, whether you're at a company or on a film, you wanna be that person who they would really not wanna lose. Um, and if you can get yourself in that position, uh, you know, all kinds of opportunities can quickly come uh, subsequently to whatever show you're on. Great. 
if you don't mind, what I'd like to do is um, have the class, it's a small enough class, I'd like them to go around briefly. I'll name the people off as I see them. And folks, just introduce yourself to Lee and let them know what you're interested in, in either, uh, primarily I would assume production, but why you're interested in film, if that's okay. Michael, why don't you start? Hi, I am um, a junior here and I, I'm just in like, documentaries, nonfiction films, and editing is my thing as well. I really like that. Um, but hopefully I'm going to try to go and do some documentary work in the future. And that's just what I want to do with my um, with myself. Great. Okay, Darwin. Hello, I'm Darwin. Uh, I'm also a junior. Um, I'm a jack of all trades. Trades, I pretty much do whatever pertains to my interests. Uh, yeah. Well, well, what else was I supposed to answer? That's, that's good enough. We love okay. question. Um, right now, you're, you're a filmmaker. Period. Great. There you go. Yeah. Right now we're in the midst of doing cover letters and resumes in preparation for applying for positions. Um, would you recommend that? Uh, I've always kind of suggested that you might be a good editor, you might be a good cinematographer, all of these things, but when you apply for a job, focus on one of those. Have your editorial resume ready and your cinema, rather than saying, no one sold Darwin, I'm a jack of all trades. Right, well, I mean, I suppose it depends on what you're applying for. I mean, you wanna focus, you know, what you're trying to highlight in your skill set to, uh, you know, to, to, to make the people you're wanting to work for want to hire you. Right. So, I mean, I, you know, if I was hiring somebody and I saw that they were really interested in a lot of different things, that's not a negative for me. I mean, in my mind, that doesn't mean that they weren't focusing on any one thing. It just means that they're passionate about a lot of different things. And looking at my own career, I've done a lot of different kinds of things while I've been at Pixar um, because I'm interested in a lot of things. I'm interested in editing. I'm interested in sound design. I'm interested in writing. I'm interested in directing all of those things. And uh, so, you know, you don't, you don't have to pigeonhole yourself into one particular thing, but at the same time, you know, you, you want to be aware of, uh, you know, the job that you're going for and try to put that part of yourself forward. Sure. Curtis. Uh, I'm Curtis. I'm a, senior um i guess I, I would love to go on and just be an independent filmmaker uh make shorts and uh hopefully a feature at some point uh yeah great anna hi i'm anna i'm a junior and um you know i'm interested in doing everything you know anything i could get my hands on but the thing that I'm most interested in is working for like children's TV. That really interests me. So, yeah. Okay. Great. Amy, you with us? Hi, I'm Amy. I'm a junior. And I am, again, I'm into a lot of things as well. Editing, camera work, cinematography, and photography as well. Um, and I'm kind of working on narrowing it down a little. No. Good. I think that's what college should do for you. Megan? Hi, I'm Megan. Um, I'm a screenwriter and um, I'm really interested in working with scripts in any aspect of the process. Um, and I'd like to work as a producer in the future um, or a director if I get the opportunity. Um, and I'm a senior at Keene. Great. Colleen? Hello. Hi. I am a junior and my like a like a bun, like everyone else I am interested in a lot of different stuff but my top interest is writing cinematography editing and sound design all right fair enough Dylan hi I'm Dylan I'm a senior here and uh, what I'm interested in is uh, writing directing and producing I want to now focusing on like horror movies and avant-garde and experimental films and I just want to get out and start making movies and start telling stories and just entertaining. Great. 
And Riley's in our black box because his webcam doesn't work. But Riley, introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Riley. Um, I'm a junior and I'm interested mostly in editing and cinematography. I'm not sure what for yet, um, what kind of films, but um, I'm learning as I go along here. Good. Sounds good. So we've got, um, I, I know lots of them have uh, some good questions. Uh, I'm going to ask Colleen to start. Colleen, you had a couple of good questions for Lee. Okay, so main question I wanted to ask you, Lee, was what do you find the main difference in directing between a animated feature and a live action? Um, that's a question I get a lot. And uh, what I typically tell people, which is I think the best way to answer is that it's more alike than it is different. Um, at the end of the day, my job, whether I'm directing an animated film or a live action film, is that I'm going to have an audience sitting in a theater looking up at a big screen or sitting in their living room watching their television. And uh, they're going to watch something that I made and I need to entertain them, right? And the, the, the toolkit that I have to tell my story is really just about exactly the same in, in both mediums. Um, I'm still working. I still need to write a, you know, a good script. Um, I, I need to cast actors. I need to work with those actors. You know, the act, in, in the case of animation, the actors are providing the voices. And then my animators are really actors. They're providing the physical performance uh, for the characters. Um, you know, I have to deal with editing and, and, uh, and blocking and camera movement and sound design, working with a composer. I mean, all those same things that I would be doing in live action, I'm also doing in animation. The biggest difference is that in live action, a lot of those things you need to kind of do all at once because you're on a set. You're working with your cinematographer, you're working with your actors, you're talking with your producer, whatever. There's lots of stuff going on and it can be really, um, it can be really invigorating and it can also be really challenging and crazy making. In animation, and, and part of the reason that I've ended up staying working in animation so long, is that um, I'm not forced into having to keep a lot of plates spinning at the same time. You know, I can focus on really discrete aspects of the movie, whether it's the physical performance or the vocal performance from the actor. Um, I'm, I'm just doing that one thing and, and kind of giving it my full attention. Uh, and I have more time because it takes longer to make an animated film so that I can uh, kind of marry all those different elements into a finished film, right? Does that make sense? So it's, it's again, I, I, I think of myself as a filmmaker. I'm not an animator. I don't know how to animate. I'm a filmmaker and, and I've just happened to have worked in the medium of animation for a long time. Great. Now, when you, you mentioned that, obviously, your adjustments to uh, vocal performance, I assume you go into a sound studio with your actor and he or she will give the performance and you'll give advice and wait and they'll change given what you want. Is it the same thing for your animators then? If you have a character and like, do you at first let your animators just kind of go with what they think it's going to look like and you come in and give them, oh, he needs to change this way or that? Well, I know in both, in both situations, um, I, I really need to make sure that I give the, the, the performer, whether it's a, a voice actor or the animator, kind of full context for what they're doing. Because with, you know, let's say I have Tom Hanks in the recording studio, if Tom's doing a live action film, he's very much in the moment, right? He's in a costume, he's on a set, he, uh, you know, you can kind of kind of put yourself there and perform the scene with the other actors that you're doing the scene with. When I'm with him in a recording studio, it's just me and him. No costume, no makeup, no set. We're just in a dark recording studio. And so I have to kind of paint a picture for him and tell him exactly what's going on in the scene, where he's coming from, where he's going to. Uh, if there's any subtext in the scene, you know, he might be acting one way, but worried about something else underneath. I need to give him all of that. Um, and then for someone like Tom, Tom is very uh, giving as an actor and he's happy to just try things lots of different ways. 
and you know you're you're just we're recording digitally so that's cheap the only thing you're you're paying for is studio time so we'll just go four hours at a time and just uh we'll try stuff as written but we'll also you know stray from it sometimes and you know i'm always interested in having actors improv if that's something that they're comfortable doing now to jump to the the animators before they start their work before an animator ever touches a shot we've already built a lot of foundation and bedrock for that moment um, we've already worked out the camera move. We, you know, we know what the, what the framing of the shot is. We know which characters are in that shot. And we have really rudimentary rough blocking in place for where the characters need to move relative to the camera and each other, right? So that's kind of there in place. And then I have conversations with the, with the animators, the same way I would talk to an actor about what's going on with the character. What are they thinking about? You know, are they lying? Are they being truthful? I mean, there are a million shadings to how you can play something. And of course, they're also hearing the vocal performance from the voice actor. So that inspires them as well. So we, I, we, we have a conversation, but then, you know, I, I don't wanna just lock them into any one way of doing things. So within the context of that box that I provided them, I do want them to go off and think about the shot and bring a lot of surprising, unexpected quirks or like little moments or subtle shadings to the performance um, that will surprise me. I love being surprised. Sometimes I'm surprised in a bad way and then I have to give notes and we have to kind of course correct and, and, and get the, the shot working again. But um, I, you know, we try to maintain a, a super collaborative environment so everyone can kind of bring things to the table. And then it's my job as the director to be kind of the captain of the ship and make decisions about which way we're heading, you know, with any given element of the movie that we're working on. Great, thanks. Megan, you had a question? Megan? <laughs> Sorry, I was on mute. Um, so my question for you was, um, the success of your films, a lot of your an animated films have been very successful. And I was wondering um, what has the success of these films and the um, cultural kind of appreciation for these films, what has um, that taught you? I don't know what it's taught me, but I know that it's given me a lot of freedom and it's given Pixar a lot of freedom because with success comes, um, a longer leash, you know? We're spending a lot of movie, a lot of money on these movies. And when I say we, it's Pixar and Disney, you know, who are paying for these movies and they can be $150 million, right? So that's an investment that the studio is making with hope that they'll get a return on that investment. That's kind of the nitty gritty of the, like the business end of things. When you get an opportunity as a filmmaker to make a movie with that um, opportunity to be creative comes a, a, a fiscal responsibility because you 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 need what you, you need to do your best to make what you're working on successful. Now, yes, we have been very lucky that our movies have been like extraordinarily successful over the years, and what that's afforded us um, is uh, a lot of creative autonomy. You know, Disney doesn't really get involved with what we're doing, and it allows us to take risks and make movies like Coco or like Up that, uh, you know, at, at first glance might not seem like obvious um, commercial films. Um, but we don't want to just, you know, we don't, we don't choose the projects that we make just based on whether we think they'll make money or not. We, we choose projects based on uh, how original they are and uh, their potential to be funny or to be emotional. Um, they're, they're just, they're story ideas that we're passionate about. And, and I guess I, I just feel lucky that our success has allowed us to keep making uh, kind of unusual outside the box movies that maybe another studio would have made. One of the things that I always noticed from the Pixar films, all of your films that you've done, not just you, but Pixar in general, reminded me of the uh, Bugs Bunny, uh, the, the, the Chuck Jones things in that it appeals to kids but there's also an additional level that the adults can pick up. Uh, is that clearly intentional or is it more just you folks write what in, entertains you? Well, we do just write what entertains us. I mean, at the end of the day, we're, we're just making movies that we want to see. Um, we, we know that kids are going to be a part of our audience. 
because we're making movies for Disney and that's kind of the area that we've carved out is making uh, quote unquote family films, which in my mind really means movies for everybody. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, if I tried to make something that kids would like, I think I would fail miserably. I mean, I think if any of you, if you turn on most children's programming, it's, it's kind of awful and you don't want to watch it. Like when you guys have kids someday, your kids are going to want to watch stuff and you're just going to go to sleep on the couch because it's, it's, it's terrible. Um, because I, you know, every kid is different, of course, but I, I, I think that by and large kids just don't have taste and they'll, they'll watch whatever you put them in front of. So what we have tried to do over the years is just make movies that we want to see and make sure that they're appropriate for kids. You know, that's really the, the, the secret. Like we're not going to put anything in that's going to be wildly inappropriate for kids. But at the same time, we do choose to put things in that maybe push the boundaries a little bit uh, or maybe a little challenging uh, because I, I, I think we all feel that, you know, watching movies is part of how we learn about life and how we learn about being, a per being an empathetic person. And uh, to see characters kind of going through challenges themselves uh, whether, you know, I don't know that it overtly teaches you anything, but you, you, you take something in on some level and it, and it affects you and your, your growth as a human. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm rambling a little bit, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, we just, we want to make movies that anybody can watch, you know, and it always kills me when people say, oh, I've never seen a Pixar movie. We don't have any kids. <laughs> and I just think, well, you're sorry. You're just completely missing out on a lot of good movies. Um, so there's a bias and there's a bias in, in the United States kind of more than any other country in the world of animation being something that's for kids. You know, you go to Japan and animation is really on equal par to live action over there. Um, so, I mean, I know it's, it's, there's a lot of respect for animation in the U S as well, but, uh, I would say by and large, people think of it as being something for kids. And, um, I don't think I would have stayed at Pixar for 25 years if I thought I was just making movies for kids. Fair enough. Amy? Hello. My question would be, is writing for animated characters much different than writing for real people if you do find that there is a difference? I don't think so. I don't think there's any difference, honestly. I mean, you know, whether your animated character is a human or a fish or a robot, I mean, you're, you're still you're still creating a story uh, of a character that has a soul and that has, um, uh, has agency, you know, and, and can make decisions, uh, good or bad, that propel them through a story. Um, so it's, it's, it's not like it's any harder or less hard uh, uh, to, to write for animation. It's really the same. I mean, I suppose you have a broader palette to work with potentially in terms of the kinds of things you can do. Um, but I don't know. I mean, there are plenty of live action stories that are really fanciful and have all kinds of crazy visual stuff going on in them. Um, yeah, no, I don't think it's any different. I mean, I, I think it's actually more rewarding for writers sometimes to work in animation at, uh, the, I'm talking about Pixar specifically just because they're so involved with the process for so long and they're kind of an integral part of it. They're not just going off and writing a draft for two months on their own and turning it in for notes. They're actually in the room with the director day, day after day, kind of, uh, it's almost more like a, a TV writer's room where you've got a bunch of people sitting around a table and you're kind of hashing things out and trying to break the story. And then the writer can go away and actually do the nitty gritty of, of writing pages. Um, but uh, it's, uh, it's very rewarding and it's very different than a lot of, you know, when we have writers come up to work with us who haven't worked in animation before, they, I think they mostly really love it because it's such a different experience than they're used to. When you're considering projects, like you, you've wrapped up a project, you're ready to go on, whether it's you or, or the business of, of Pixar, to go on to the next film, um, what considerations do you make in because you alluded it can be years that you're mm -hmm. going to be working on that project and how do you maintain that passion well i mean that that is an issue and so uh, that's something that i'm thinking about quite a lot early on is is this an idea that i can live with for the next six years of my life um 
I mean, that's what happened with Coco. I, I had directed Toy Story 3 and, you know, about a year or so after it came out, a little less than a year, I started thinking about, you know, what I was going to be up to next and kicked around a lot of different ideas. Um, and Pixar actually asks the filmmakers to pitch three different ideas. Um, and we do that because we don't want the filmmakers to put all their eggs in one basket. They want them to kind of just kick around different ideas. It, it, it both allows the filmmaker to kind of be thinking about different things, but it also gives the studio some flexibility as they pick, you know, what's the right film to be the next Pixar film, for instance. And so with Coco, even though I really didn't know what the story was going to be at the very beginning of the process, I knew the world. I knew that I wanted to potentially tell a story set in Mexico against the, the celebration of Dia de los Muertos. And um, the, the more research that I did and the more time that I spent, I became more and more convinced that I had the opportunity to make a, a totally unique original film different than anything I had done previously. And um, that's often enough to start to get passionate about a given project. Okay. Michael, you had a question? Um, so how uh, did you make the jump from editing to directing and what was like the most difficult part of that transition? Um, it was a weird transition. Well, it wasn't a weird transition, but it's weird that it happened. There aren't a lot of editors that jump from editing into directing. Um, but in animation, there were like none. Like I, I still don't know of any editors who have made the leap into directing animation because most directors in animation come from uh, either story, like uh, storyboarding or uh, from animation. Um, in my case, and this goes back to something I said at the beginning when I was talking with, uh, I can't see everybody here, uh, but when I was talking to Darwin about kind of like loving lots of different things, I've always loved lots of different things. And so when I got to Pixar, even though I came as an editor, I also had a director hat I could wear. Uh, I had a sound designer hat I had written. Um, I had done lots of different things and I could bring that to the table. So what happened specifically was when I worked on the original Toy Story movie, um, the director, John Lasseter, he was brilliant at directing animation and, uh, and, and at writing, but, um, but kind of layout, uh, which in animation is what encompasses kind of all the camera work and the staging of the film, that kind of wasn't his thing so much. And when he realized that I was really into that and, uh, and I had good instincts, he started to delegate a lot of that to me. So even though I was by name the editor of Toy Story, I was actually supervising kind of all the camera work on the movie. Um, so that kind of happened over time between Toy Story and then editing A Bug's Life and also supervising all of the staging and the camera work. Um, I was already taking on lots of directorial things on my plate. So it was a pretty easy jump when John then asked me to co-direct Toy Story 2 with him uh, to start to learn about the, the aspects of the production that I didn't know so well, like working with animators, um, all the work that happens in the art department, that kind of thing. Um, so I, I won't say it was a really difficult transition for me just because I was already kind of wearing a bunch of different hats even from the beginning. I mean, I, I, let me just say one more thing is that, I mean, editing is my biggest passion. I do lots of things and I think I do them pretty well, but editing is the thing that I feel like is, it's not effortless for me, but it's the thing that I can lose myself in the most and I feel like I'm really good at taking something that's not working and bringing something great out of it. So um, even though I have gone on to direct, I still edit. I mean, I edited Coco with somebody. I edited Toy Story 3. I've always edited, even when I started directing. Um, because I feel that editing is really second only to directing in terms of having an impact on the finished film. Um, you can really completely make or break the film um, in the editing room. And uh, I just love having that degree of control. It's kind of godlike to be able to manipulate all these different elements and try to bring it together into a, a cohesive whole that works and affects an audience. And so uh, that almost seems to make the most sense to me to, to move from editing to directing. 
but I know that a lot of editors are introverts and don't like the last thing they would want to do is have to be on a set, you know, directing a whole crew full of people. So I think that's why you don't see a lot more editors doing that. But in terms of their skill sets and instincts, I think that they are the best people to move on into directing. If we take a look at the progress or the, the development of a lot of your characters in your films in particular, from Toy Story on, and in particular with Toy Story 3 and Coco, I noticed that they seem to get, if not darker, but certainly more mature. Was that, I assume that was obviously an intentional choice on your part? Yeah, I would use more mature rather than dark. Um, is it intentional? I don't know. I mean, I was 25 years old when I started working at Pixar. And by the time I was making Coco, you know, I was a lot older. I'd had three children, had a lot more life experience. And I think just with life experience, you, you just maybe think about some things more deeply than you do when you're in your 20s. And, um, you know, the kinds of things we think about and, and experiences that we have in life, whether it's losing friends or whatever, that has a way of kind of coloring the art that you create. And, uh, and again, kind of circling back to what I said earlier, I think kids are not only are capable of handling a lot of things that maybe some people think is too mature for them, but um, I mean, obviously there's some things that are, would be wildly inappropriate uh, to put in a film that kids are gonna watch. But just from a, from a thematic standpoint, I think you can go some places um, and it's fine and kids get it. And if they don't get it, it's okay if it goes over their head. But um, I think it's good to give uh, everyone something to think about when they watch a film. Right. Even if it's something that's maybe a little heavy. Right, Curtis? Uh, so I know you're a big fan of Stanley Kubrick. Um, how has his films um, influenced your artistic vision and your kind of filmmaking? Sure. Um, yeah, I'm a big fan of Stanley Kubrick's and uh, um, I saw his movie, The Shining, when I was 12 years old, when it first came out in theaters. And that was the movie that got me interested in making movies. I had always been interested in movies and saw a lot of films with my mom. But that was the one that I remember. It was the first time I actively remember being aware of the, the, uh, the hand of an artist kind of behind the camera. And so watching that film led me to watch a lot of other Stanley Kubrick films. And then everything just kind of blossomed from there. So, uh, and I remain a big Stanley Kubrick fan. In fact, I'm, I've been working for a few years now on a a book on the making of The Shining that's going to be published by Tashin next year. Um, how has it affected my work? Um, I never ape anything directly, but certainly the foundation of my sense of film was formed in part by watching his films. So there are a lot of, there are a lot of, there's a lot of shorthand that I can use if I'm trying to evoke a certain feeling from the audience and sometimes I'm aware that I'm maybe doing something similar to something I saw in a Kubrick film. I mean, I'm it, sometimes I'll even like, sorry, sometimes I'll even bring up a, you know, one of his films, a scene, just to reference it because that's faster than trying to explain something to people. Um, and that extends into music and sound design. I mean, I've had composers reference little things from the music from The Shining that I find unsettling. And we've used that in other films. We did something in Finding Nemo that was a direct lift of a kind of a musical thing that was used in The Shining. Um, so I definitely reference those things just be, and, and I can't help it. And a lot of times I'm probably not even aware of it when I'm doing it. It's just whatever, whatever we watch and whatever inspires us and makes us passionate as, as we become filmmakers is inevitably going to color and affect the things that we then make ourselves. I always tell my students either as screenwriters or whatever, uh, steal from the best and then uh, try to make it your own. Exactly. I'm going to... Because um, they're stealing too. Right, of course. <laughs> I'm going to digress briefly and say I'm sure you're familiar with um, AI, artificial intelligence. That The Kubrick, movie? Yeah, that Kubrick started is my understanding. Well, he developed it for a long time, yeah. I didn't know if he, I didn't know how much you were aware. It seemed to me that I could see a break in that I thought this is where like Kubrick died and Spielberg took it over. But did Spielberg, was it all produced and directed by him? I, 
by, by Spielberg? Yeah, I, it's very much Spielberg's film. Was it? Okay, fair enough. Yeah. Darwin, you had a question? Yeah. Um, I had watched your Criterion Closet Picks video recently, and you had uh -huh. mentioned that you had watched Bicycle Thieves in one of your film classes. And I was curious as to if there was a film from your film classes that you consider to be the most inspirational to you and maybe your uh, future career in film. Wow. I don't know. There's so many. Um, I mean, when I was in film school, one of the cool things for me is that I, my, I had a job. I had a campus job as a projectionist. Uh, at the film school. And so in addition to making my own films and taking classes, I would also show movies for lots of other film classes. So pretty much on a daily basis, I was watching movies, which was awesome. Um, and I, you know, it's a great thing about your film school years is you could just expose yourself to a lot of different things. And, you know, some things will just start to burrow their way into you and you can start to, can start to lead you on a path. Um, I don't know. There are just so many movies. I mean, I don't think I'd ever seen a Robert Altman film until I was in film school. And I think I saw Nashville first and just like totally fell in love with that film and the, the vibe of it and the way he worked with actors and the freedom that he gave them um, and his way of kind of recording everybody on the set at the same time so that he could selectively mix later, like who you were hearing in scenes was, was not anything I'd ever seen before. Um, uh, Blue Velvet came out when I was in film school and David Lynch came and talked. And that was a moment I remember being like super, super inspirational because that movie just blew my mind so much. And he blew my mind as a person, as a film director. Um, so, I mean, I, if I sat here and thought I could come up with probably a million different movies that influenced me in one way or another, but um, you know, Now's the time. Take the time to watch a lot of movies because you're not going to have as much time later in your life. Uh, so now's the time to kind of do it as, as much as you can. Just try to voraciously eat movies. Somehow people like Scorsese manage to still watch like two movies a day. I don't know how they do it because life has a way of getting in the way of that. But, but um, yeah, you just, you know, you learn a ton watching movies. And if you see a movie that, that hits you in some unusual way, which isn't often, right? I mean, most movies are not great. And you're lucky to see a few handful of movies a year that really get you excited. I know that's the case for me. But when I do, I want to like go deep and kind of learn more about that film and about that filmmaker. You know, I, this like last year, last few years, I've really gotten into um, Ari Aster's films. Hereditary and Midsommar. And, you know, I've reached out and talked with him and just because he's, he was doing something that was so different than anyone else was doing and doing it so effectively and so intelligently. And, and he, like he, like Ari and Paul Thomas Anderson, um, these are filmmakers that I feel like they are just in control of every last aspect, every tool at their disposal for making a film. From writing to directing to sound design to composition, delighting, all of those things feel like completely um, under their umbrella. And uh, I really admire when, when, when I come across filmmakers like that who are doing something that's uniquely their voice. You know, you watch a P.T. Anderson film, you know you're watching a P.T. Anderson film. And I'd say the same for Ari Aster. And there are not a lot of filmmakers like that. There are a lot of filmmakers that are chameleons and they can work in lots of different genres and that's great too. But I'm especially impressed when when now, you know, over a hundred years into people making movies, well over a hundred years, 100 and, what, 130 years now, to be able to do something that has an original voice that's unique uh, is, is really to be admired. What quality is it of Kubrick's that you respect most as, of him as a director? Or can you nail it down to one in particular? Well, part of it for me is how he made his movies. And now that I you know, know so much about how he actually made his films, he made his films with mostly really tiny crews uh, and productions that went on a long time. And he, he did that because, again, he knew he was spending a lot of money from the studio and he needed to uh, attempt to give the studio a return on their investment. So for him to be able to be creative and not be rushed and to kind of take his time to make a film, he knew he had to 
find a way of making those movies with a very small crew. So he wasn't paying a lot of people to sit around on the set every day. So I admire that about him, that he managed to be an, an artist in the midst of what is ultimately a business, right? And do it so uniquely and effectively. From a, from a filmmaking standpoint, um, you know, I just admire how pr the, the precision of control that he had over everything from performance to his compositions, to his lighting, sound design, music choice, everything. I mean, he's one of those people. You watch, you plunk someone down in front of a Kubrick film, they know that you know you're watching a Kubrick, Kubrick film. Right. You talk about kind of the um, potential contradiction between business and art. Um, how do we, how, what would you advise our graduates here in merging those two? When they get out, they're gonna to have to support themselves, but we consider ourselves artists, don't we? Yeah, well, when you're getting started, you can't be too picky about the opportunities that come along. I mean, I, my first job was as an assistant editor, you know, and I worked for about a year as an assistant editor on some really crappy TV shows. But I knew they were crappy, but I was also grateful to have the opportunity and I learned a ton working on them a ton. And I built relationships with the people that I was working with. And those relationships are almost as important as anything in terms of where your next job is going to come from. So even though the actual material you're working on may not be something that you imagined yourself working on, there's still great value in working on just about anything. Even if it's to just to tell you, I don't want to ever do that again, you know? Um, so it's all of value. I mean, I look back, I, I know that the stuff that I worked on was kind of crap and uh, I don't even know if anyone watches it anymore. But, um, but again, I, I worked with great people. I learned a ton while I was working there and it, it forced me to learn a lot of um, uh, diligence and to, you know, I had schedules to meet. I had to have cuts done, uh, you know, with no excuse for being late. I mean, they just had to be done. Things had to be done on time, on budget. And so I did it and I learned how to do it. So um, in terms of the whole art versus, versus commerce thing, it's just the reality of our business. Unless you're a self-funded uh, independent filmmaker who doesn't need to make any money back, you know, that's very few people. Um, you, you have to juggle the two. Uh, and, and that comes with experience and, um, but, it, but it's absolutely something you have to do. I mean, any of you, if you think you're just gonna go out and create art for the world, that's not gonna happen, you know, because the, the, this, this field that we're getting into, that you're getting into, uh, makes things that are very, very expensive. And so as a filmmaker, you have to not only bring your artistic chops to the table, but you also have to bring the responsibility that you can make choices that can stay within a, a box of a budget. You know, I mean, there was a lot I wanted to do on Coco. The biggest, the biggest challenge of making Coco was that the scope of what I had in my mind was larger than what we could do that we could that we could afford to do either financially or time wise. And so we had to do a lot of creative thinking about how to give the illusion, give the feeling of kind of a bigger world than what we were actually creating. It had to evoke a larger world. So hopefully when people watch the movie, they get a sense of this kind of whole world that we created in the land of the dead in that film. But if you look at what we actually created to, to, uh, to get there, it's, it's, a, it's a relatively small subset of what I had imagined originally. So there's a way to, I, and I'll tell you, th those, those constraints will make you a better artist. You know, if you, if, you, um, if you have limitations that you have to work within, I'll tell you pretty much 99% of the time, they're going to make your project better. You know, because they're going to force you to not go with your first instinct. You're going to have to think deeper about things. You know, do you have to cut things sometimes that you wish you didn't? Sure, that's going to happen sometimes. But at the end of the day, if most of the project is what you wanted it to be, then you, you need to call that a success. Good. Anna? Um, I was wondering if you ever see yourself working on other types of animation other than 3D animation? 
So probably like maybe like 2D or something. I probably won't work in 2D animation just because I don't know a lot about it. I mean, I know a lot about the storytelling involved and I suppose I could do that, you know, if I was, if I had the right people around me. What I'm more interested in, if I ever do animation again, and I don't know that I will, I, I, I don't, I'm not sure. I would love to do something like way different than anything I could ever make at Pixar. Um, because Pixar is really the best place on the planet to make an animated movie, in my opinion. Um, and the only reason I would ever make an animated film not at Pixar would have to be subject matter that, that would just be not appropriate for Pixar. Like if I were to do a, a horror film or something like that. So I would be interested in that, but, um, but I, I don't know, you know, maybe that's in my future, I'm not sure. Dylan, you got a question? Dylan. Hey. Yeah, sorry, I was on mute too. Um, in directing animated films, what has been the hardest thing for you? Like in your, what, what the hardest thing you've ever experienced? Um, well, some of the things that were hard for me are very specific just because I didn't have a background in animation. A lot of the people that I worked with went to Cal Arts, you know, went to schools that where they studied animation specifically. So they kind of lived, ate and breathed animation. And that wasn't my life. I, I, <clears throat> I had nothing against animation before I went to Pixar, but that certainly wasn't my passion. Um, so when I started getting opportunities to direct at Pixar, uh, I had a lot of anxiety about the things that I didn't know and the experience that I didn't have. I was really worried about, say, directing animators because I felt like they were going to think, like, who are you to be telling me what to do when you're not an animator yourself? Like, these are the things that kept me up at night and that I worried about. But it was all kind of foolish. Like, that was, those were just my own insecurities because at the end of the day, I already had the respect at the studio for being a filmmaker and being a storyteller. And so even though I was starting to wade into waters that I didn't have experience with, um, I had a lot of support from people who believed in me and, and like helped shore me up. I was surrounded by really talented people. And I would say that's the case for anybody who's getting into a situation that they're not, that's new to them is try to surround yourself with great people. I remember way back when I was in film school, Kevin Costner came and talked about directing Dances with Wolves. So he's making the jump from being an actor in front of the camera to directing a, a big feature film. And he had no experience with that. And he talked a lot about how he tried to make sure that uh, he didn't bring any first time people on board in any other positions, you know, from his editor to his cinematographer. Uh, everyone were people that had like really deep experience behind them so that they could help guide him and answer his questions along the way because he was having to learn on the job. And I've had to do that too. I've had to learn on the job uh, to some degree. And um, so it's just good to have people around you. So those are the kinds of things that are hard. Um, and then it's just hard to make a movie, right? I mean, it's just hard. It's a lot of work. You have to have a lot of stamina. You're gonna have a lot of days where you feel like you don't know what the hell you're doing and that you're a fraud and that people are gonna be on to you and, um, and that your story is never gonna work and your film is never gonna work. That's stuff you have to live with and that's just on you personally to deal with those feelings and, and figure out how to get past them and, and keep going. Um, because I don't care who you are, you know, Spielberg talks about how he's had plenty of days where he's afraid to go to the set because he feels like he doesn't know how to tackle, you know, whatever he is he's shooting that day or he feels like the movie's out of control. Uh, maybe not so much now is kind of earlier in his career, but um, those are normal feelings to have. Uh, now, that doesn't mean you wear your heart on your sleeve and tell everyone on your set that you're insecure and you don't really know what you're doing. I mean, you have to put on, you know, a bit of a, a, a coat of authority, you know, but at the same time, keep yourself open to ideas from other people. And it's also really to have, really important to have people around you who you can share your insecurities with, you know, when you come home at the end of a day on the set and you feel like you don't know what you're doing. It's good to have people to talk to who can buck you up and tell you that you're great and that everything will work out. Cause you're all, you're all gonna face that stuff and uh, it's normal and you just have to get past it. And with every project you do, you'll have a little, little more confidence. But I'll tell you, I, I mean, I made movies for 25 years at Pixar, even when on day one of Coco, that it really was, you know, it was no easier than any other film. Every new story, storytelling is just difficult. People have been telling stories for thousands of years and it hasn't gotten any easier. Which of the films were- Sorry, I rambled a bit there, but- 
There you go. We're used to it. They're used to it with me. Um, of all the films that you've worked on in any capacity, which one do you feel has come closest to your vision? You talk about, you know, you're never going to be completely happy with the film, but which one satisfied you the most? Um, well, I've only directed two features as a solo director. So I have to say it's those two films and, and for different reasons. Um, when I was co-directing Monsters, Inc. and Finding Nemo in uh, Toy Story 2, I was there kind of in a capacity as Robin to Batman, okay. right? I was there alongside the director each and every day, fighting the fights, getting the movie made. But at the end of the day, it was their film. And it was my job to kind of understand the film they were making and try to make it the best as it, you know, make it the best it could be. When I was directing Toy Story 3 and Coco, obviously I was in charge and I was kind of running the creative shots completely on those films. Um, I'm very proud of both. I'm proud of Toy Story 3 because it was, it was very difficult to step into those shoes and be at the helm of a, a sequel to two of the most beloved films of all time. I could have easily failed and it would have been a very public failure. Um, so I'm very grateful that everything worked out with that film and people loved it as much as they did. Um, and then Coco, I'm proud of really for a couple of reasons. One, because it was a orig completely original film that I thought up and, and uh, it's, it's really satisfying to see that come to fruition, but also from a, from a cultural standpoint, um, we worked very, very hard all throughout the making of Coco to make sure that the film was culturally respectful and uh, accurate and that we involved as many people from the Latino community as possible in the making of the film. And, uh, you know, making a film is hard, period. Layering on that responsibility made it like much more difficult, but, but I knew it was necessary and vital. And so I committed to that. And uh, so I, you know, so that ended up being very rewarding when the film was embraced around the world, but especially by the Latino community, both in the US and in Mexico and around the world. Um, so I, I'm kind of equally proud of and, and happy with both films for the same reasons. I don't feel like I, and this, this comes down to the, the, one of the pluses of working in animation is that you have a very long runway. You have a lot of opportunity to mess up and feel your way through the film and get it to be just what you want it to be. So when I look at both films, there's very little compromise that I see in either of them. And I don't think that's the case for most live action filmmakers. I mean, I, I've been told by uh, Gary Rydstrom, the sound designer, told me that Spielberg never watches any of his films after they're finished because it's just too painful for him because he has the movie in his mind that he envisioned when he you know, first set off on making that film. And then there's the finished film. And very often the finished film is not quite what he imagined it could be for a million reasons that you run into when you're doing live action. And so uh, I don't know if that's true, but that's what Gary told me is that, um, that Spielberg, it's just too painful for him to watch the films again after they're done. What was it that drove a Midwestern kid to create a uh, so phenomenal a film about the Latino community? What got you involved in that interest? Um, I don't even know if I was aware of the, the, the celebration of Dia de los Muertos when I was growing up. But I certainly was aware of it in college, living in Los Angeles. You know, there's a big Latino community there, of course. And I also spent a lot of time going to kind of underground art galleries. And, and I saw a lot of, uh, there was one gallery in particular in LA called uh, La Luz de la Jesus, I think. And they had a lot of um, folk art and iconography from Day of the Dead. And there was something about it that just really drew me in. Um, you know, I grew up with my, my conception of death being a very gray, somber, kind of Victorian <laughs> way of looking at death. And then all of a sudden here I'm seeing this like glitter and bright colors. And uh, it was just so different than anything that I'd experienced. I was fascinated by it. Um, so that was, that was the beginning of me. And, and I hadn't seen anything like that in a movie before, live action or animated. And so I knew that it could be really original and interesting, but it wasn't until I then started to really do research. And uh, of course, 
went on many trips down to Mexico and spent a lot of time with beautiful families out in very rural parts of Mexico uh, that I started to really learn about kind of the core of what the celebration is really about and started to see opportunities to tell a story um, set against that. I mean, at the end of the day, I wanted to, I wanted to tell a story that wasn't just set against, uh, that didn't just happen to be set against Dia de Muertos, but rather um, had to be told during Dia de Muertos. I mean, the, the story we told couldn't be set somewhere else, you know, at another time. It, it's a very specifically about that celebration. And uh, um, it was a great journey. I mean, we all love to learn about things we don't know about, right? And I don't think that films have to be made by people of that culture. That being said, I think it's very important to, uh, to help bring up and support people from those communities to tell their own stories and make their own films because they should be as well. We should have films from everybody, male, female, every color, every religion. Um, but that being said, I think that there is value to people outside of a community turning the lens on that community. Um, I was told by a lot of people down in Mexico that they had lost their relationship with Dia de Muertos. It was something they thought of that their grandparents did or beyond. And in a lot of ways, Coco kind of brought an awareness and an importance and urgency back to a lot of younger people to, to care about this, these traditions. And so I'm glad that I was able to do that. And I, I did that and now I've stepped back from it. And I don't think of that as my film anymore. I mean, the film has been really embraced by the community. It's been very embraced by the country of Mexico and it's their film now. And it's part of, it's part of the culture in its own way. And, uh, and I'm happy for that. Great. We're closing in on about an hour. I've got a couple other folks who have some questions. Riley, you have a question for Lee or not? Megan, you can oh, ask yeah. Me. yeah, so go, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, go ahead, Riley. Riley, you with it? Yeah, sorry. Um, do you enjoy working more with animated characters um, as opposed to live ones? Like, is it easier to work with or um, easier to manage? Well, I'm not really working with animated characters, right? I'm working with people who are making the movie, you know? So the characters are what they are, but I'm, but, but I'm working with people. And like I said earlier, you know, I, I have the actors providing the voices and my animators are kind of actors. They are very much actors themselves providing the physical performance. So I'm not, I'm not sitting and having a conversation with Woody right? And working with him, I'm working with Tom Hanks, or I'm working with the animators who are animating Woody. So um, it doesn't feel a lot different to me than when I'm on a live action set working with people. It, it's just, I, I, I've got my crew around me and, and I'm helping to guide them towards a destination. Um, I think I already outlined kind of earlier what kind of some of the advantages that I've seen to working in animation in terms of uh, lack of creative compromise and, and other things. Um, I don't know, there are things that are good about both. There's something, there's, in live action, there's something to be said for standing on a set and the sun's not right and there's planes flying overhead and your actor doesn't know their lines. And you know, there's an energy that comes from that being in that crucible and a lot of good things can come out of that. Um, and one of our challenges in animation, since we're spending a lot of long time making the film and we're like looking through a microscope a lot of the time, focusing on one tiny little aspect of the film, it can become challenging to maintain that feeling of spontaneity because you want the film to feel like it's just naturally unfolding for the first time. When in fact, you've spent six years, you know, meticulously crafting it. So I've just learned over time the things that I need to do to help keep the film feeling spontaneous. Um, but I like both. I mean, they're just, they're just, I'm a storyteller, I'm a filmmaker, and you know, I'd like to think that I would have just as much fulfillment making a documentary as I would doing the other things that I've done. Great, got time for a couple more questions, I hope. Uh, we have Megan had some questions I know earlier on, I wanna make sure she gets to ask. Yeah, we have a graduate first who snuck her way in. Kelsey, you've got a question for Lee? Probably appropriate for everybody, I would think. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
I have three questions. The worst, the first one being very, very easy. Is that the wild robot book on the shelf behind you? Is that what? One of the books on the shelf behind you. Is that the wild robot? The wild robot? Yeah. The one with kind of the trees. <laughs> no. I don't uh -huh. know which one you're talking about, but I don't have a book with that title. Okay. Um, uh, the second question was, uh, first I want to say, I'm really glad that you mentioned that you did a lot of research into doing Coco. And um, I, I don't remember how much it was mentioned in college, like how much research you would have to do. And so is the research as you go through the movie making it, is it like an ongoing process with like a lot in the beginning and then, you know, um, adding more as you go along, that kind of thing. Um, I will say research, well, it depends on the story you're telling, of course, but research can be really, really vital. And we've been lucky at Pixar that from the top of the studio, they support that research because it can be expensive sometime. If I want to take 20 people down to Mexico for a week or two, that's expensive. So um, it's great having that support and if you're in a position to be able to do that. But, you know, sitting at a computer on the internet isn't the same as going to Mexico, but you can still learn a lot by spending the time doing that or, or seeking out people that have the experiences that your characters are, have in your story and sitting talking with them. I mean, that can be invaluable. Um, yeah, research is just, it's super, super important because otherwise, if you're, if you're telling a story that's not, you know, 100% in your wheelhouse and in your experience, you're going to just start making stuff up or even worse, you're going to just start cribbing from things you've seen in other movies. And you don't want to do that. You, you want what you're doing to be original and, uh, you know, uh, I don't know if authentic is the right word, but you want it, you want it to be original and unique and you want it to come from a, a real place. And, um, you know, a lot of great things can come out of just sitting and talking to somebody, you know, who has experience. We, on Coco, I mean, we, we, we met so many people and visited so many places. And the bulk of that, of course, is early on, because that's when you have time to do that kind of thing. When you're actually making a film, there's no time for research anymore. Um, so that's all happening kind of early on during pre-production and the writing process. Um, but yeah, I would, I would advise anybody to, to, to really do deep research because you're going to stumble upon things that you didn't know. I mean, in the case of Coco, we have this whole idea that's very central to the film, which is that we all have the potential to die multiple deaths, that you die when your heart stops beating, but you also die in a way when there's nobody left on the planet who, who knew you or who remembers you. And that's a really poignant idea that I had never heard before. And I didn't even hear until I was deep into doing research on the film. And the moment somebody said that to me, it, it just struck me as a very powerful idea. I didn't see how it would fit into the story that we were developing at the time. But as time went on, I came to realize that that really needed to be like the central idea of the film. And uh, so that 100% came out of doing research. I never would have just made that up on my own out of thin air. Yeah, and I feel like with research, it can help, you know, with that, what you just said, the finding your through line, or just like little details like that and stuff, and also help people become like, um, more confident that they can tell other stories than just like, what their life experience is. Yes. Yeah. Um, and then my last question is, how would somebody get a script into like the hands of somebody at Pixar? Um, what is the best way for a recent grad or somebody still in college to do that? Um, unfortunately, Pixar doesn't take anything unsolicited. Um, the only way that writers come into Pixar is it's typically through agents. Um, if a, if a given director wants to work with a writer, uh, like, and this happened with, to me, both with Toy Story 3 and with Coco, uh, we basically have a development department at Pixar and their job is not to develop story ideas, it's to work with the directors and help them through the writing process and to, um, to bring them writers to potentially work with. So 
in my case, I would get a stack of scripts on my desk and start reading. And eventually, hopefully, I would find one that, you know, had a sensibility that I was really attracted to. And that would then lead potentially to having a meeting with the writer. Um, and then possibly eventually, you know, starting to work with them. But we, in all our 25 years of work, we've never, we've never adapted a book. Not that we never would, we just haven't. And we also um, have never made a film based upon a, like an outside submission. Everything that we've ever done has been driven by the director uh, developing a story idea. So I wish I had better news for you about getting a script into Pixar, but um, that can happen. It just can't happen by you just sending a script to Pixar. Right? Oh no, I, I figured that was the process. <laughs> just didn't know. Right, because you can imagine you'd be, the studio would, would just be buried by the number of people that would be wanting to send their story ideas to Pixar. Um, oh, yeah. I want to circle back to, what was your second question again? Oh, uh, like the importance to, of, good Lord. The oh, of research. Of research. Right. I just want to speak to a corollary that's important. Even if you're telling a story that's not your own life experience, you will find ways to bring bits of yourself to that story in interesting, unexpected ways. And I'll give you an example. At the end of Toy Story 3, for those of you who've seen it, um, you know, the movie ends basically with Andy giving his toys away to a little girl at the end of the film, right before he heads off to college. And there was a moment where I knew Andy was going to be seeing his toys for the last time and kind of saying goodbye to them. And I immediately thought about my grandmother. Um, my grandmother died while I was editing the first Toy Story film. And uh, she had cancer and we knew that she didn't have long. And so I flew back to Cleveland and I spent you know, several days with her. And then it was time for me to leave and, and head back to California. Um, and the moment that I said goodbye to my grandmother, I knew was truly a goodbye. You know, I knew that I was not going to be seeing her again. And we were out at a, a, a brunch at a restaurant and she was there kind of surrounded by her friends. You know, I gave her a hug. It was very hard for me because I knew that was the last time I was going to hug her. I then walked away. I said my goodbyes because I had to go to the airport. I walked away with my wife and uh, I stopped at the door and I turned back and I looked at my grandmother one last time because I knew that this, this was the last time I was ever going to be laying eyes on her. And so uh, she wasn't even looking at me. She was like laughing and talking with friends, but I kind of grabbed a mental snapshot in that moment and then turned away and left. And that was it. I never saw my grandmother again, but I have in my heart, I've held on to that moment that I looked back at her and kind of grabbed that moment and kind of seared it into myself. And so when we were coming up with that moment with Andy saying goodbye to the toys, that was what I immediately thought about. And it seemed completely relevant for that moment. And so when it came time to work with the animator who animated those shots of Andy in his car, I told him the same story I just told you, maybe in a little more detail, but uh, I told him that and, and that I wanted the same for Andy. I wanted Andy to be kind of looking up and kind of grabbing one last moment of looking at his toys before he left, before he left them, before he headed off into adulthood, everything that was happening at that moment. And even though the audience, of course, no one knows that story at all, but that moment is powerful and emotional for some surface reasons, but there's also stuff underneath it that they don't know about, but I think it imbues the moment with some authenticity and some real heart and emotion uh, because of an experience that I had in my life that's, that was completely unrelated to saying goodbye to my toys from my childhood. So it's, again, I'm sorry I went on about that, but I just, want to make you aware that even, even if you're working on a project that's completely different than anything you have experience with, there are ways to bring yourself to that project. Yeah, no, that's, thank you for sharing that. That adds a lot of context to it. And I, when you were saying that uh, Pixar is accessible for all ages, um, something like that, I think kids do pick up on. And then later in life, when they need something, like when they experience their first loss, for example, they'll think back on that moment. And, you know, even though it's hard and stuff, they'll know it's going to be okay. So 
yeah, no, thank you for sharing that. Was sure. Thanks. Do you have a qu another question for Lee? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I had a question about, um, I think you heard a little bit of it before about the Toy Story films. Um, and I just wanted to preface it first by saying, um, I know that many of us have really held those in high esteem in our childhood. I think they've been very important for us, especially for myself. Um, and more specifically, I think the character of Jesse has been an incredible role model for myself growing up. And I can say that for many young women. Um, so I just wanted to ask you about a specific scene in the in Toy Story 2 that you directed, um, because oh, right. I, under, I understood it to be very important to the character, but I think some people would disagree. Um, can you talk about the scene with the Sarah McLaughlin song and um, Jesse sitting on the window and that whole scene with her and um, her owner leaving her behind? Mm -hmm. Well, what to say about that? I mean, I'll just tell you very quickly kind of the history of that moment. Um, originally, we actually had a whole scene there with dialogue where Jesse told Woody the story of how she had been abandoned, you know, that her, her owner had grown up and kind of abandoned her. And for us, it seemed like a powerful idea, but every every which way that we wrote it and tried to execute it, it just wasn't landing. It wasn't emotional. And so we finally started kicking around the idea of there being a song there. And even though the Toy Story movies aren't musicals per se, there was a precedent from the first Toy Story of having songs be a part of the storytelling, like with You've Got a Friend in Me, and there are actually one or two other songs in that movie. Um, so we started thinking about doing a song uh, for Jesse. And we started by, I can't remember whose song it was. Was it, was it a Bonnie Raitt song? I can't remember what we tempted it with, but we found a song that had the right feeling. And we just used that as temp and then kind of built like a visual storytelling without any dialogue over that song. And for the first time, the, it started to land as being really, really emotional. And so we went to Randy Newman and asked him to write a song for that moment. And he had just recently worked with, I think he had worked with Sarah. No, 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 sorry. He had worked with the person who we attempt with. Um, but we brought in Sarah McLaughlin and um, asked her to sing it. And it all just came together. And she sang it beautifully. And, uh, uh, you know, I thought it was very effective. I remember when I first showed the movie at USC, because I'd gone to USC film school and I like to go back with the movies that I worked on. In that moment, I really panicked because it was very early on and we hadn't shown the movie to a lot of people yet, but there were a lot of people laughing during that scene. You know, because you could say it's a little sappy, you know, it's, 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 it's emotional. And uh, I was hearing this laughing, it really caught me off guard because we were all really connecting with it as we were making it. Um, and I just realized, you know, when you're, when you're going to college, you're going through lots of transitions and for guys especially, like, I shouldn't say that, it's like for everybody, you're, you're going through this transition from childhood to adulthood. And a lot of times anything that has to do with your childhood can be seen as like something to avoid and move on from somehow. And I think a lot of people just felt like the need because they were sitting with their bros to like laugh at the moment and not allow them, because maybe they were feeling something inside, I don't know. Um, and that's how it came out was by like snickering during that scene, but I've always remembered that. Um, but it hasn't kept me from really trying to go for emotion all the time in every movie that I've made. Um, you know, I know that there will be some percentage of the audience that doesn't want to allow themselves to go there and feel those things, but it's not a reason not to try. So I don't know if that was the answer you were looking for, but uh, I don't know what else to say about that moment. Yes, I was just kind of wondering the, why you chose to put it in there, because I know as a child watching it, it was extremely important to see that character's kind of softer side. So mm -hmm. I just want to, for a ch childhood myself, I really, really played well. Oh, good. So. I'm, I'm glad, uh, <laughs> glad it was meaningful for you. We kept Lee around a little longer than our hour. Does anybody have anything super urgent we've got to ask before we let him go? Well, I don't have anything urgent, but I did have a question. <laughs> uh, okay, so kind of circling back to when you were talking about, excuse me, sorry. 
Coco, um, my question was more along the lines of like when you were talking about pitches, um, how does representation kind of fit in with your pitch ideas? Because I know that now I feel like there's a lot more um, family movies that are more diverse. So is that like a switch that was, you know, switched in Pixar or I don't know, like how did that, how does that work with your Well, pitch? it was a switch that switched in Pixar as well as the rest of the film industry, right. long overdue. Um, but that switch kind of happened after we were already making Coco. So at the time I pitched Coco, that wasn't at the forefront the way it is now. I mean, now we're, I mean, we're, we're talking about like 50-50 male, female uh, representation and characters on screen and, uh, you know, telling more diverse stories um, and, and getting more diversity behind the camera as well. Um, you know, Pixar is very actively doing that. I say we, even though I'm not there anymore officially, I'm not there full time, but I am, I still have a big foot in the door. Um, uh, so yes, it's very, very important. But at the time that I pitched it, you know, I, I knew even from the beginning that I, that it was going to be a challenge because I was a white guy making a, making a movie about a culture that was not my own. And, uh, so I knew from the very beginning that it was really vital to do as much research as I could to surround myself with, uh, with diverse thoughts and people from that community. Um, I knew for sure that the entire cast needed to be Mexican or Mexican American. And we did that. Um, so, and the fact that the film ended up being as successful as it was, I think in its own small way helped nudge everybody in the industry forward a little bit to say that, oh, you can make a movie about brown people and people will go see it and it can be successful and be a good movie. Um, and it's, and it's, it's those steps. We're in a time right now where everyone's kind of taking steps and you're going to start seeing slow change. It's nothing that can happen overnight, but it is happening and it's changing. And the next generation is going to just take it for granted, which is a good thing. Right. Yeah, yep. thanks. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? I have um, a question I want to ask quickly regarding um, career development. And um, I guess you're sure looking for like um, different internships in different places. Um, with, in your experience, obviously not now with COVID, but has Pixar ever um, accepted internships from college students? Yes, Pixar has a really amazing internship program. Again, we're in COVID right now. So nobody is at Pixar, like literally nobody is in the building. So that's really unfortunate uh, for people that want to have that opportunity. But when things are humming along normally, and they will get back to normal at some point, um, we have a really rich internship program in the summer. Uh, we bring in people from colleges all over the country to specialize in animation. We have interns in the editorial department. We have interns on the technical side, sound, everyone. You bring in lots of people, they have great experiences, and quite often they end up getting hired. Adrian Molina, who was my co-director on Coco, he started uh, as a summer intern way back when. Uh, so, and, and there are a lot of people that that's true for. I'm not saying everybody gets hired who does an internship, but if you're good and you stand out when you're there, you know, we just, we want more good people there. And, uh, so when things get back to normal, yes, I would look into it. If you go to the Pixar website, they actually have a whole section that's about, they have an internship program and they also have a, like a residency uh, kind of program for graduate students. Great. Last chance, folks. Okay, I'll ask everybody to stick around uh, briefly, but we'll summarize. Um, Lee, thank you so much for spending time with us. Sure, you're welcome. It's great to be here. Um, I'd like to thank Misty Kennedy and Mark Kempler for helping coordinate all this. And anybody who's watching, again, uh, Lee was our second guest in our weekly series. Next week, we'll be meeting with KSC film grad and uh, editor of the Netflix uh, Jeffrey Epstein film, James Steelman. So that'll be at 7 o'clock on Mondays. Uh, other than that, thanks very much for tuning in, and hopefully we'll see you next week. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Lee.
Okay, everybody's out now. Great, I think that does us. Great job, everybody. Thank you, folks. Hopefully you got some uh, decent information out of that. Mark and Misty, thank you very much. Uh, let's take like 20 minutes. Let's be back at 20 till nine. I just want to go over briefly. Uh, we didn't get a chance to talk a lot about cover letters. I've got a little bit to talk about that. And then um, we'll get out of here pretty soon. So see you in like 20 minutes. Um, I, I made you host, so you'll be able to carry this on. Um, I will uh, I will say good night and uh, we'll talk to you later this week. Thanks, Mark. Excellent.